What's up, everybody? It's Dusty the Nar with Backstage Guitar, and this is The Green Room. What's up, everybody? Welcome to The Green Room. I'm here with my good friend, Patrick McAloon. He is a wonderful solo musician. He's a guitarist and singer with the Pat McGee Band. Of course, you may know him from his 2019 stint on The Voice. Uh, Patrick, thank you so much for coming on the show. Welcome to the green room. Oh man, I'm psyched to be here. I'm honored and uh, psyched yeah. to catch up and talk. That's awesome. Yeah, it's been a while, man. You've been busy. And um, I just want to hop right in and we'll start with the basics. Uh, yeah. How did you get interested in playing guitar? Oh, guitar for me was middle school. Um, my dad and my uncle actually both kind of jammed together and uh i figured this is easy it wasn't <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah my dad really inspired me and i mean he still he still picks here and there but uh you know i've gone on to to play a lot more than he does <laughs> well i'm sure that makes him super proud everyone wants to see their their kids eclipse them in talent which we'll, we'll probably talk about yours later yours are certainly more talented than you <laughs> oh yes indeed yes indeed which is a hard bar to clear let me tell you oh dude <laughs> so when did you know that that was life for you not just like a hobby it's your life yeah I mean I was I was hell-bent on going to music school like right out of high school um I went to Berkeley College of Music in Boston and even before then, um, you know, I was playing open mics in high school and getting the occasional gig. And then by the time I hit my senior year of high school, I think I was working like four nights a week at that point, you know, so for a 17 year old kid, I was like living the dream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This and, big uh, you know, Those don't yeah. Hurt. yeah. But it was, you know, I, I was kind of a working musician through college and then, um, you know, I didn't finish at Berkeley, as a lot of people at Berkeley do. <laughs> um, I, was, I, I was lucky enough to uh, to get out there and be gigging and working. So you know, it was it was pretty pretty fast and furious from from middle school to to gigging by the time college hit, and you know, just working like crazy. Well, finish or not, you sure took a lot of knowledge with you from that university, and. Uh, I mean, in, in all the situations I've been in with you personally, musically, you're not only playing the guitar, playing the mandolin, uh, singing, you're also the onstage tech guy, probably <laughs> against your will to, you know, to an extent, but you're solving problems, you're figuring out how to get the best sound, um, you're, you're kind of an all around like jack of all trades. Where did that come from? Um, I would say I'm as much a nerd as I am a musician. So I've always gravitated towards, um, you know, the techie side of things. And, and I really enjoy problem solving. And so it was just like, and for me, it was a natural progression. Like, okay, you know, I need to amplify my guitar. Cool. What do I plug it into? What makes it sound better? What, you know, what can I do to make, you know, make all this work um so i just kind of learned school of hard knocks and you know at berkeley i did everything i could to i wasn't uh, an engineering production major um but i did everything i could to absorb you know knowledge from those guys to friends that i'd made and go to every studio session that i could get invited to and just really really immerse myself in in everything so and well you certainly continued doing that in your career you just got off a boat. What, what was your latest tour with Six Man? Oh, Six Man. Um, so I've I've kind of dipped my toe in the in the other side of, of the industry as well. And I've been working um, artist relations for a company called Six Man in, in Atlanta, Georgia. And they put on music festivals on cruise ships. So uh, I've been lucky enough to sail as an artist with Pat McGee a bunch of times on those boats, um, the rock boat. Um, train does uh they have a cruise called sail across the sun uh, that we went on a bunch of those as artists as well and so yeah i i take care of artists i i, I work the other side and i get to take care of my fellow artists and make sure that they're good and happy and having a great time and and taken care of while they're at these festivals it's funny you came up in my recent discussion with pat and he was telling me that you were out on the ship 
and you know he he intimated to me like you were you were out there before you had a job maybe and you were just kind of helping out and they offered you a job right and pat's you know pat says he's going to be out there a day and they're going to offer him a job and sure <laughs> he did and pat you know pat is a full supporter of it but man he's he uh he needs you on stage buddy you're yeah i mean i'm i'm very lucky in the fact that you know it's funny, I, I did a couple of boats just these past two weeks. I was out in the Caribbean for two weeks. I flew home. I'm going out to do two weeks of dates with Pat, and then I'm flying right back to Miami and going out on one more boat. So Six Man is cool in, in that, you know, their schedule is kind of seasonal. Like, they'll sail a couple times a year, and they're growing, but, um, you know, I'm able to balance my artistry, my my gigging with, you know, doing that as well, which is a pretty awesome, you know, handshake. Yeah. Well, you um, you do play solo gigs, but you've made yeah. a career of being a side man, too. And I those those are two totally different things. I mean, for the non-player, they see, well, what's the difference? You're up on stage, you're singing, but you <laughs> really have to know the subtleties of you know when do I get to step out and when am I here to make the main artist sound the best that he or she can can you speak a little bit of, on those differences yeah I mean I think um speaking to the the sideman side of that that equation um I think having been a front man and been a band leader for as many years as I have actually brought kind of a cool perspective as a sideman because I understand all the things that a front man's going through because I've been the front man, I've been the band leader and I need my guys to guys or girls or, you know what I mean? Cause I've had them all, <laughs> um, you know, to, to be on my team. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that I bring a little different perspective to being a sideman with Pat because I really understand what he's going through you know, on a day of a show or even on a travel day or whatever, you know, like I'm a huge fan of being a team player, you know what I mean? And, and I've, I've always been that way. I've always wanted for the greater good of the whole. Um, and, and like you said, you know, knowing when it's time to, to lay things back and, and support um, and, and when it's your moment to sort of step out. Um, and Pat's really gracious about that. You know what I mean? He, he, he definitely throws around the love on stage to, to those of us that play oh, with him. You've done some, some beautiful solo numbers on stage, just the shows I've been there. And I've stepped on your toes a bunch with the bass <laughs> while you were trying to do it. So uh, I certainly know the, the talented musician you are. But sticking with the sideman thing for just a minute, you have had some amazing opportunities because of that gig specifically. You have been on the stage with Train many times. I mean, I, I don't even know all the artists that you've played with, but one of the coolest things that you got to do is fly out to LA to be in a studio with, well, I'll let you tell the story. Oh, that was, uh, that was a pinch me moment for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Pat set out to, you know, with a goal of, of making a record that, that you know, paid homage to you know that era of you know James Taylor and Jackson Brown and Carol King and Linda Ronstadt right and and we sought you know players that sounded like that that were going to bring that to the table and we started throwing around names like man I wish you could get somebody that sounds like Wadi Wattel on guitar or Lee Sklar on bass or Russ Kunkel on drums or Danny Korchmar you know and all these players and then at some point in the conversation you know, somebody had the guts to say, well, why don't we just find them? <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and no then that, ultimately, that ultimately became a reality, which was insane. Um, <clears throat> you know, we, we flew out to LA and, uh, you know, got those guys in the studio. We had Russ, we had Leland, we had Wadi, we had all those guys, we had Danny and, you know, we cut it live at producer. Oh, it, it's called Boulevard Recording Now, um, this, this space, but it was Producers Workshop, which is where Pink Floyd made the wall, McCartney recorded there. I mean, there's so much rock and roll history there. And, and, and you guys and we, not only uh, cut it live, but you cut it to tape, right? Yes, yes. We sought out, you know, going into the process, we had full intention of releasing vinyl and we wanted to stay true to the era. 
-hmm. And so we cut it live. We cut it live to tape. Um, when we mastered it, obviously we dumped it into to Pro Tools for mixing and, and that type of thing and mastering, of course. But we actually did two separate masterings, one specifically for vinyl and one for the digital release. Um, so we really tried to stay as honest and true to the process. But you know what I mean? To, to, make, to make a record with those dudes and be in the studio and having that piece of rock and roll history speaking to me and my performances and saying, dude, you're doing a really good job. And I'm like, what? You know, like it was, it truly was a pinch me moment. Um, one quick little anecdote, fun story to that. Um, Wadi Watel um, came into the studio the very first day. So it was just load in day. We didn't, we didn't make any music. We just came in on day one and it was, you know, get the kit set up, get all the amps set up, get everything going. And uh, they were, they were just reeling up the tape, you know, good old two inch Studer. And, you know, it was pretty amazing. And, and, uh, and so they're just you know, reeling up the tape and you can, you know, you hear that, you know, that you hear when you, when you fire up a two inch tape machine. Sweating and yeah, totally. And, uh, <laughs> and so Wadi just happens to be walking through the control room, right. As I'm in there. And he kind of like turns and looks at, at the tape machine queuing up and he looks straight, he looks at me, he looks me in the eyes and he kind of like chuckles and he just goes, bold. <laughs> and I was just like, oh sure, yes, yes. yes, why do you want to tell things we're ballsy and doing this? And it just, it was like, so it felt so good. <laughs> What's even better is that he's not shaking at all. You know, he's like, oh, we're doing tape, you know? Yeah, I'm yeah. sure I can see Lee Sklar walking in with his, like, little rig and just, you know, coming in and sitting down and not saying much. But I remember how starstruck I felt just to be playing Lee Sklar's bass lines. So to be, you know, that's like one degree of Kevin Bacon away. To be like zero degrees <laughs> of Kevin Bacon away just must have been insane. It, it, it was absolutely insane. I, my schedule only allowed for me to be there for the first three days of basics. Um, so I didn't get to stick around, but I did get lots of FaceTime videos from Pat for the last two days of the session, you know, of Russ Kunkel just, you know, doing like conga parts and shakers and stuff. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm watching this happen in real time. Like Pat would just FaceTime me and he would leave it on the window of the control room, just facing in and he would just walk away and I'd just be like, <sighs> well, that's not the only cool thing you've done. So my viewers are definitely want to going to want to hear about your, uh, we'll call it a more modern experience where you're playing with the classic guys and then you end up with Adam Levine. So how did the voice happen? The voice, um, so I guess I was on their radar just from being in the music industry, playing with Pat, playing solo shows. And, and there was a little bit of a, you know, we've had, you know, collectively a lot of our mutual friends that have gone on to, to the show. Um, Tony Luca is, is a friend of, of ours, you know, from playing um, Paul Fow is another one, Joshua Davis. Uh, these are all guys that we've collectively shared the stage with, with Pat and, and different festivals and things like that, but guys that we keep in touch with on the regular, they're friends. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so, so they'd done it over the different seasons and everything. And I think I was just sort of, enveloped in that um that umbrella you know what i mean and so um some of the you know producers reached out to me and just said hey man you know what have you been up to i know we've we've talked before but but what have you been up to lately and and a big part of what i'd been up to at that time which i believe was 2018 when they reached out or maybe it was 2017 i think it was 2018 um it was like early 2018. And I said, well, I've been making a lot of music with my daughter, Ruby, um, who maybe we'll, we'll talk about momentarily, but uh, she's also a singer songwriter. And, um, and so I'd mentioned to them like, Hey, I'm, I'm doing this thing. You guys want to maybe think about a dad daughter thing. And, and, and the producer said, yeah, you want to think about a dad daughter competition. <laughs> and we were like, Oh, that's a different <laughs> spin. And, uh, and so ultimately we agreed to it. Ruby and I talked about it a lot. Ruby was 16 at the time, you know what I mean? So, so pretty early in, in her, you know, 
endeavors as a musician she she'd been writing music and, and playing local shows and things like that but um yeah we said you know what i mean let let's let's give it a go you know um we went out to la and and we did the blinds and and we spent a good amount of time out there and you know like as a father to be able to spend that much time specifically with one of your children and you, you, it's it's wonderful you know what i mean most people sure. are like oh i gotta go to work or this or whatever you know and you don't get to spend days on end you know what i mean having some quality time let alone with a freaking amazing experience you know what i mean so nationally uh, televised and not only that but a little bit of a uh oh i don't know what you would call it but a little bit of a a story they did on you guys in that competition that was i think that caught a lot of a lot of america's attention when you guys did that yeah it was definitely something unique you know you you've seen the you know family duo or trio go on the show before but um you know and and it was it was cool because you know the music that ruby's making is awesome and it's you know it's kind of in that singer songwriter genre, but it definitely leans a lot more pop than the music that I write. And so it was really cool for her to be able to stand on her own as an artist, you know, for both of us to sort of say, Hey, this is what I do. This is what I do. You know what I mean? And, and it was, it was really cool. It was really cool. Now I, I've been dying to ask you, I haven't gotten the chance to ask you, but I get chills watching the moment when the chairs spin around. <laughs> I just know the feeling of being a musician, being up there, being, maybe you weren't afraid, but you were, you know, not sure if it was going to happen. Yeah. In that moment, what's going through your mind? Blake <laughs> turns around, right? Um, Adam turns around as soon as he see, sees Blake turn around. You get John to turn around at the very end. I mean, what's going through your mind? So. I mean, the whole process was, you know, it was so unique. And, and for me, you know, I mean, I was already in my forties at that point. Right. Um, and so, you know, I, I look back on it and, you know, I tell people all the time that, you know, my perspective was maybe different than a lot of these 20 year old kids perspective that were trying to be on this show. And for me, you know, I think I went into it with nothing to lose. Right. <laughs> you know, be, being my age. And so um, I, I, I meditate as often as I can. And I spent a lot of time meditating while I was out in LA during the blind audition process. So I felt like I was in a really peaceful place going into it. Um, and I was okay with whatever the outcome was going to be walking through those doors, you know, like I'm standing in that holding area and they were like, here you go. And they opened the doors and I was like, well, here we go, you know? And, you know, for me, ultimately it was a gig, you know what I mean? We all have, we all have all sorts of gigs. Um, it was a gig. It was an amazing gig <laughs> and the gig is over. Right. Just like every other gig, you know, so like if I could compartmentalize that experience and not come away from it, like, oh, my God, I'm never going to do anything again. I'm never going to work all those things. You know, you can't go into that experience with that kind of mindset because you're going to walk away defeated. Well, you were fortunate so, enough to have kind of a hell of a career before that moment, which is I'm sure what you're saying, whereas a lot of these younger people are are it is a life or death feeling for them. Like, you know, they're there to really get their big break of which yeah. you, you've had, you know, some. Yeah. I mean, I've been lucky enough to be a working musician for 25 plus years at this point, you know, it's crazy to say that. Um, and you're right. You know, the younger, the younger kids definitely felt like that was their moment, but, but what I wished for them. Right. And I talked to a lot of them, you know, cause I was the old guy, <laughs> but I talked to no, a lot I'm of them. I was singing the high harmony on, on free falling. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. Uh, uh, but I talked to a lot of these kids, you know, I say kids, you know, cause they really are like some of these guys, I was 20 years, their senior, you know what I mean? And, and so we had a lot of conversations like off camera, you know, that, cause we had a lot of time to spend together during that process that, you know, I was like, I just wanted to 
you know, convey to them, like, just go out there, be passionate, play in front of human beings, play a shitty bar gig, you know what I mean? Do all the things that you've got to do to cut your teeth. You know, reality TV is a wonderful springboard, but it's not the be all end all way to do this, right? There's a million ways to make a living as a musician. You know, you can be a songwriter and never step on stage. You can be in a cover band and make tons of money every weekend and have a blast with your buddies. You can, you know what I mean? There's so many different ways to make a living in the music industry. And if you want it, just go for it. Go for it every which way you can. I'm really glad that you brought that up because the reality TV thing is a bit of a lottery ticket. And um, really the vast majority of working musicians just get out and beat feet on pavement and, and play a lot of gigs. And I know you've played, <laughs> I've played several with you. So you've played at least four gigs. And um, <laughs> I got to say, for as hard of a worker as you are musically, I never see you not smiling. I never see you not giving it your all and putting on a show for people. You never have a bad night. <laughs> How do you do that? I just, I, I find myself so very lucky to be in the position that I am. And I never, ever take that for granted. Um, Playing music is a freaking blast. Playing music with your friends is even more fun, right? Um, and, and playing music for, for people that appreciate it and want to hear it makes it even that much better. But the crazy thing is, is, you know, like people say it all the time, like, oh, you never know who's in the audience, right? And I've had that happen in real life numerous times where an opportunity came up at a gig where there was seven people at the gig or you know what I mean? and that person that happened to be in the crowd was oh hey you know i'm i'm a talent buyer for this big national you know venue that has venues all over the country uh or you know hey we used to come see you 20 years ago and you made an impression on us and now we run this festival or we do these things you know these charity events or we give back to the military and you know so there's been all these opportunities that it's a slow burn. You know what I mean? It's, it's, you know, always give your best. And, you know, I, I, I joke with people that it's like getting paid to eat ice cream. I mean, unless you're lactose intolerant and then fuck, you know, <laughs> then music's not for you, <laughs> but it's fun. I mean, you know, like how many people get to say that they love what they're doing? You know what I mean? I love well, it. Okay. I gotta say one of the coolest moments of my life you were there for, which was, <laughs> Um, now, I don't have the, the experience that you have going on stage with acts like Train and, and, and playing all these huge gigs, but um, we did a cool one together. It was Manhattan. We, we went to film a video at Adam Dirtz of Counting Crow's house. Yes. He was there watching. We went and played another gig that day in Brooklyn. And then we got invited to the Bowery Electric that night to watch Adam and Rob Thomas play. Then we got invited to the after party and I can draw a line from that moment straight back to playing Annie at the Delaware Children's Theater 10 years before. So to your point about the slow burn, you never know who's in the audience. Okay. It really is, you have to give it all on every gig. And I can't think of somebody who does it better and more consistently than you. Oh, um, that's very kind. <laughs> but I bet that your daughter does as well. So let's talk about Ruby. What is she up to lately? Ruby is, uh, so we had been living in Nashville through most of, uh, most of COVID, you know, we, we moved there in January of 2020 and, uh, you know, got the wind taken out of our sails a little bit there, but, uh, we loved it. And, uh, we had some things pulling us back to the Northeast. So we're in Rhode Island now. Um, which was kind of home base for us prior to Nashville anyway. So um, we're loving being back here. But um, in Nashville, she was just writing a ton. She had a bunch of great opportunities, um, she's collaborating with, with other writers. And uh, she's, you know, buttoning up the last bits of demos for, for album number two. Um, she released an EP a couple of years ago, kind of not long after The Voice, um, and uh, yeah, she's been really coming to her own as a, as a songwriter. And uh, I'm, I'm happily her side man as often as I can be, 
you know. Um, so it's I love that thing so, as a parent to get the chance yeah. to play with your kid and support yeah. that. It's, it's fun. Um, but uh, yeah, so she's she's writing a bunch um, and she's playing solo shows and just getting out there. You know, music, live music is just starting to get back, as we all know. You know, these these gigs are starting to happen and and, uh, you know, she's she's out there hungry for them just like we are. <laughs> so hopefully we're not vying for the same date. <laughs> <laughs> you're vying for the same day. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a gig you're going to lose every time, buddy. I don't right. know what about that one. What about fashion? Is she still into fashion? She's, uh, yeah, so she's, um, actually, it's funny because uh, she's sort of got this, uh, you know, I don't want to keep using the, the, the slow burn term, but she's got sort of a, a concept, um, you know, a concept uh, where she wants to, be releasing a fashion line that coincides with a record that she's writing. I don't know that it's this one, but she's kind of creating designs that, um, you know, emote the songs that she's writing simultaneously. So what, it'll be sort of like a concept uh, fashion line release that coincides with an album release. So that's that's sort of like one of the, the fashion um, music things that she's got melding together right now which is pretty cool you know like as someone who's artistic to be able to to be creative in multiple medias and find a way to to make them happen kind of in tandem with one another I think that's pretty sweet it's exciting well it, it it's a family trait because <laughs> of like going going back to all the different facets of music you have your hand in uh, you've been working with six man, you, you play solo shows, you have solo releases, you, you're a side man, uh, you're just hustling. Yes. And one of the things that I ask all my guests, I usually have a little bit more direction, which is what pearl of wisdom relating to the music business that you've learned along the way, can you share with the viewer to save them some time and effort? And normally I would have an idea of like, about guitar or about but I have no idea so I'm just gonna let you like whatever you can think of whatever facet of the music industry something that you've learned that you can share um oddly enough it's 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 um the biggest thing for me um and I I feel like maybe in my younger days I was I was naive to this piece of of the equation um, and it's never been a focus for me, um, but the networking aspect of the music industry, as I as as I age, <laughs> um, like a fine line. That's right, sir. Um, as I age, it's it's the relationships that mean the most to me, right? It's it's. Um, I, I was lucky enough to mentor a couple of, of, um, of high school aged kids um, in the town that we lived in because we had a program where if it was something they were their senior year, if they were passionate about something, they, they had this sort of independent study type of situation where they, they got to go off and, and, and do a project and it was for a grade and everything and they had to have an adult mentor and, and I, I, I mentored two different graduating um, high school seniors that year and that we're both trying to pursue music careers and you know i told them that like you know proficiency at your instrument and creativity that's that's obviously paramount but kind of in tandem with that is the relationships that you make over over the course of things and and the relationships that you keep you know what i mean and and i'm you know i said earlier like playing music with your friends i I count most of these people that I've networked with over the years, my friends, you know what I mean? I, they mean a lot to me. And, and I hope, you know, I hope the feeling is mutual. You know what I mean? I, 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 Justin, I love you. And I, I'm honored, like I said, to be on this podcast, but I, I consider you a friend and I, and I love every chance we get to make music together, to spend time together, maybe have a beer, catch up, see how our families are doing. And, you know, the longer you stay in this industry, the smaller the family gets, you know what I mean? Small, tighter, tighter knit the family gets. Um, in fact, the family grows, but it gets, it gets tighter knit. And so, you know, I, I think that the pearl of wisdom is, you know, 
enjoy the people that you're making music with, you know, continue those relationships on and off the stage. Um, because someday you're probably going to get a phone call from one of those friends. It's like, Hey man, I've got a great gig and you're important to me and you'd be a great fit for this gig. And so, you know, maintain the relationships that you build over the years. That's, that's, that's my, you know, it's a, a wonderful piece of advice. I'm glad I left it an open, an open uh, road for you to travel down because that, that is very true. And it's, it's a much, it's a much better, uh, a much better way to enjoy music is making it with people that you care about yeah. rather than getting up there. And, you know, I'm sure you were never guilty of this, but certainly in my youth, I was a narcissistic young guitarist who <laughs> didn't, you know, wasn't going to let anybody tell me what to do. And, uh, mm. and, you know, meeting people like you, it, 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 it really is a reminder that um, it is a family out there. And so I'm glad you brought yeah. that up. Yeah. Well, Patrick, again, man, it's always great to catch up with you. It's been too long, but thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing that wisdom. Um, what's what's next for you? 2022, man, we're getting back at live music. So lots of dates with Pat. Really excited about that. And, um, you know, definitely some more uh, you have some more six man work and taking care of other artists and, you know, giving the love back as best I can. So. That's, that's what's on my radar for the near future. That's awesome, man. Well, for the viewers, make sure that you check out Patrick McAloon. Patrick, you got a website. It's uh, patrickmacaloon.org, oh. I assume. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so yeah, mostly Pat McGee and, and rubymac.com is a great one to check out too for Ruby stuff yeah. and uh you know all the social media okay, places you model her fashions when they uh <laughs> when they come out with a concept album here we go well this has been the green room you've been watching uh patrick mcaloon talk about his experiences with the pat mcgee band sixth man his his loads of experiences uh the voice just <laughs> throw that out there again uh -huh. i'm dusty the nar if you found this interview useful please head over to backstageguitar.com to check out other interviews with other wonderful artists like patrick we also have all types of tricks of the trade, guitar lessons there. We'd love to have you. We hope to see you soon. Mm -hmm.